Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to episode number, I don't know, 483 and a half of uh, Nautel's Transmission Talk Tuesdays. I'm Jeff Welton, your host. We're going to have a little bit of fun today. As you can tell, I'm coming at you from a different angle. I managed to blow up my other webcam, so we got what we got, but I blew it up right before showtime because it's no fun otherwise. Anyway, we're uh, talking about cooling and air handling today. And uh, I had the topic in mind for a while, and then I saw an article recently that uh, kind of brought it forward. So I, I grabbed the guy that wrote that and said, hey, what are you doing? Um, with absolutely no notice whatsoever. So I want to give a big shout out and uh, welcome to Matt Goldston from Town Square in Lafayette, Louisiana. Matt, welcome aboard and thanks for being with us today. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? I'm Let's good. See. Good to see you. See if I can make this. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Now you're looking just fine. So you, you did, before we get started, you wrote an article, was it uh, Radio Guide recently, about uh, building up a shipping container into a transmitter site? Uh, in the signal, yeah, for, yeah. Uh, for this V. I did, uh, and that was something that they asked me to write, I think based on some comments I made online, but I was happy to do that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to talk about some of the things you encountered there in the, the process of the next hour. So we're just uh, going to try and cover a little bit of everything. And uh, remembering that uh, I tell folks over and over, every site's unique. So I'm not going to tell you that this will work in every situation or that will work in every situation. I'm pretty sure Matt's going to tell you that, uh, you know, if you're in Minnesota, what you do for heating might be a little different than what you do in uh, Louisiana. And, and definitely what you do for cooling and humidity control is not going to be the same. No, no, absolutely not. And I haven't lived here all my life either. So, oh, Where were you from before this? I grew up in Mississippi. And I lived there, I guess, what, almost 25 years. Then I moved to New Orleans. So I lived in this region here, then North Indiana in Fort Wayne, and then back down here. So Fort Wayne, you're almost yeah. into uh, Chicago territory. So you, you've seen so, all of the weather. So yeah, up in, I guess that's probably region three. If you're mm -hmm. looking at climate regions, you have to you have to yep. get up in northern Michigan to get to region four, probably. And we'll uh, be talking might be about off. that. To look at that. Yeah. yeah, I've got that picture coming up. Um, yeah. So, as always, for the folks that uh, I see a lot of familiar names in the list, I see one or two new folks in there that I haven't seen before. So, uh, we do try to make these Tuesday sessions as interactive as possible. So, by all means, if you got a question, type it in there. I see a few have come in already and uh, definitely will address them either when I see them or whenever I uh, happen to think it's appropriate based on where the conversation's going. Um, if you if we say something that uh, you got something you want to contribute to, then uh, definitely click the little hand raise the icon and uh, we'll certainly be happy to unmute your mic and pay, make you part of the conversation. Uh, Sean Mattenley has already asked a question, so I'll, I'll, we'll throw this out here as just a uh, little preamble. Um, Sean asked, what's the hottest temperature your transmitter has ever seen? And uh, he had one during an air conditioner failure that got to uh, ambient of 136 degrees because the fresh air damper was also stuck closed. And, and Sean doesn't have a mic. So um, I can answer uh -uh. that. I'll let you hit yours, Matt. Well, I, 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 I can say this, and I can't. Well, first of all, it wasn't. Personally, I didn't own the transmitter, but I can't tell you how hot it got, Sean. But when I was a contract engineer, there was a transmitter that I did service on, and I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was a Continental. You could physically see that the plastic shells on the meters had drooped because yep. it had gotten so hot that they started to melt. So that, that's hot, my friend. So I haven't looked to see if he's in the audience, but uh, Alex uh, Hartman, oh, he is here. Alex, uh, I'm going to grab him in a second to uh, tell the story about, uh, he, he's tested one of our boxes, uh, our Beta GV10 transmitter on both extremes, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, for me, the hottest I ever saw was in Salt Lake City, um, air conditioner compressor wired backwards, and uh, they don't like that apparently. Uh, the uh, meat thermometer in the exhaust stack of the XL60 AM transmitter said 165 degrees. Um, and the, uh, the doorknobs were hot enough you couldn't lay your hand on them for long. Um, Alex, Although, I'm gonna... 
Yeah, yeah, I will say this, Jeff. We recently had one uh, that where the transmitter site caught on fire in a fiber bond building. That mm -hmm. transmitter is still running to this day. So, <laughs> um, yeah, we were able to, my, my engineer over there in that town was able to put the fire out with an extinguisher. And we mm -hmm. were able to, the, the transmitter is being replaced because of the smoke damage. But right, right. in the meantime, we were able to get it back on the air and it Make is it running run. right now. Yeah. Uh, so. Dave Reitner asked the same question. How well do the GV and ND, NV transmitters run at 130? Uh, Alex, I unmuted you. If you want to uh, unmute yourself, let's uh, tell me your uh, high temperature story on the uh, on the GV10, how you like to cook our beta transmitters. And this is the part where Alex decides, Alex is probably not even in front of his computer or he's on the phone. So we we'll, may grab him a little later, but uh, yeah, same deal. He cooked his uh, enough that it uh, had the bezel starting to uh, melt down the front of the transmitter, the bezel that holds the touch screen in. And yeah. it was it was still making full power at the time. So let's see, good for pork and brisket. Yep, absolutely. Uh, you know you're in a bad degrees. way when the thermostat is exceeded its ability to tell you like when it's just saying 99 and it doesn't go to that third digit or like so. the old mosley mrc one where it just says ouch ouch yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right moving forward oh whoops one more note on this before i click off it um if you are an sbe member remember a Nautel webinar does qualify for half of a uh, recertification credit under category i of the research schedule so whatever spreadsheet notepad uh word document that you're keeping your uh certification stats on, make sure to add half a credit to that um, if you uh, happen to watch one of our webinars, uh, this one included. Uh, notice that uh, Wayne Pacina, our SBE president's in the audience. Uh, Wayne visits us quite a bit, so shout out to Wayne. And uh, I see a few SBE members in here. So, yep, folks, jot that down. So what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about a couple of things, um, air conditioned or um, forced air. Uh, Luis uh, Bordeaux specifies uh, that we should specify if we're talking Celsius or Fahrenheit degrees, and that's a good point, Luis. Um, all the Nautel transmitters, the specs on them are in Celsius, but uh, I know, Matt, you're down in the States, and uh, we get talking. I'm bilingual. I speak English and American, so uh, we'll probably, as we're talking, usually be talking in uh, Fahrenheit degrees for the most part. But no, that's a good point. We'll have to specify that. Um, the other thing is airflow. You can have lots of air and still have no cooling of your equipment. And I, I mean, I know I'm sure you've run into that once or twice. Uh, yes, you can, because you can have folks that don't change the filters and they're just completely blocked up. Mm -hmm. I've seen that many times. I've seen a few forced air sites where they were blowing air past the back of the transmitter 100 miles an hour, but actually none of it was going through the transmitter. Right. So, yep. I've that, also uh, seen sites where maybe a bird nest built into the duct work that went out of the site where the exhaust mm -hmm. air went out. Or this is a great story. So, one time when I worked for another consulting firm, we had a transmitter site in the bottom, uh, the basement of a high school. And there was an old Rockwell Collins 20 kilowatt transmitter down there. And the, the exhaust came out into a window well. And mm -hmm. the students at lunchtime love to throw their lunch trash into the exhaust stack. Oh. <laughs> until it until, long until, until a piece of screen was put over it. So yep. you'd find an apple in the transmitter and it nice. would smell like, smell like a distillery. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure there's worse, worse things to smell like yeah. some days, but on other but yeah, days. That you, you can't put anything past the high school students. That's for sure. So we'll also talk about long-term care, uh, the things you got to do for maintenance and uh, whatever other thoughts happen to come to mind. Now, I got a, a bunch of questions coming in. Boy, y'all are throwing the questions at me faster than I can uh, read. So that's uh, that's a good sign. And we will be hitting these as we go. Um, the uh, environment temperature systems that you were talking about, uh, and this is that, uh, you, you linked me this website there the other day. Uh, the buildingscience.com, there, there's a lot of stuff in there. Information overload, but good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, now this is uh, a really good place to go. Now, you did mention that, and, and I put this website on this slide and the next one, just so uh, folks can grab a screenshot if they want to. Of course, this will be archived. We'll get to that at the end, uh, tell you where to find that. But uh, 
One of the things you did mention was that this is geared more for uh, light commercial and uh, residential. So there are some things that may not apply to cooling big, heavy pieces of heat generating equipment like we have. Right. And the other thing I would say is if you read some stuff on this website and your building doesn't conform to their um, lofty utopian goals, that's okay. Every little thing you can do to improve what you have is a big step forward. You see what I'm saying? Like they're they're showing you a perfect world, like yeah. what would what it would be if you could build it from scratch, and um, and also they're putting out revisions to these articles all the time because they have a test lab. So don't you know take some of this stuff and realize that they're constantly improving what they think is perfect. Um, no, but it's a great to... source of factual tested information, not right. just theory. Uh, they test all this stuff in the real world. And this um, this picture specifically comes back to the zones you were talking about, although it doesn't break them down by number. I do get a kick out of the, the fact that I'm looking here, and as I look at this picture, I'm seeing uh, a good chunk of uh, of Iowa and uh, and uh, looks like uh, Idaho as uh, showing, or sorry, well, yeah, Idaho would be another one as cold. And I'm here to tell you, it gets really cold there some days, but. But yeah, it's uh, that that's a one of the biggest resources because if you don't know the environment you're in, it, it's a little harder to build for. It. And you know, a lot of folks, I don't know, I, I guess a lot of folks don't uh, think about things like humidity as an example. No, not at all. And uh, and I didn't send you this slide, but I think a lot of people don't realize that your optimal humidity is generally somewhere around forty percent. And I've seen buildings, in fact, the building that we have our studio in here, uh, we have some issues with the uh, weather sealing, and sometimes it'll rain. I'll see the humidity in here as high as 70% if I don't run the air conditioners a lot more than you would normally want to run them. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's important to keep that humidity level down to keep people feeling well and you know not seeing um, you know sinus infections and stuff like that. Yep. So uh, those are things to consider in an inhabited environment that's not necessarily mm -hmm. a big deal in a transmitter site as much um, well and with, all, I mean, with we, all the heat you know that that right gets rid of some of that now um, we do have a um, a condensing specification too so sure. i mean they, they spec uh humidity 90 percent non-condensing for most electronics equipment right. and where that gets critical and and i've run into this once or twice before if you get a site with a severely oversized air conditioning system. Correct. It doesn't run enough to uh, pull the humidity out of the air. And as a result, you can actually cause, you literally cause rain in your transmitter, which is something I've seen twice in my career. And that's always entertaining. You can cause a lot of things. You can cause uh, mold growth, you mm -hmm. can cause all sorts of things. If you don't, it's a delicate balance. To have, I think it's really wise to have one of those um, inexpensive hygrometers on the wall in your yep. site. In addition to just a thermometer, like just a not a thermostat, but just an inexpensive thermometer. Yeah, well, um, and you can buy them now. I've got a. My wife uh, does a lot of plants. We've got a. I mean, we may be one of the few people I know that have a greenhouse in the living room. But uh, she, of course, temperature and humidity controls her uh, starter plant. So we've got one of those little Honeywell temperature and uh, humidity mm -hmm. meters. Yeah, yeah, I think it was like 20 bucks on Amazon, if that. Yeah. So uh, that that's a, a really good point. Uh, Dan Look Gunter mentions yeah. having a CCL meltdown all the meters during an AC failure and destroyed several thousand dollars in components. And before we get too much further, that is a really good lead in. I mean, we're going to talk about air conditioning quite a bit, but uh, whether you air condition or, uh, I mean, you need backup, you know, and then, I mean, I beat this drum over and over, whether it's uh, dual redundant air conditioning or whether it's a uh, forced air backup, you need some kind of backup, right? Yeah, you absolutely do need a backup. Um, in fact, like, for example, at the site we just built, it only has an NX5, so the NX5 doesn't put off a lot of heat, but mm -hmm. it's in a shipping container, which is only eight by 40. So when you look at the amount of cubic feet of air that are in the shipping container, it wouldn't take long if you had no air conditioning 
for that NX5 to heat up that air to be very warm in there. Yeah. Um, you know, making five kilowatts of RF. Uh, so, and you and I had talked about that when we were engineering that site. We talked about the the heat load and the balance and everything. So we ended up putting, I think it was two ton and a half uh, mini splits in there. Mm -hmm. But we don't run them both at the same time. I have one in what's called dry mode, which yeah. it essentially functions as a dehumidifier mm -hmm. and just keeps that uh, humidity level where we want it to be. But it would come on and cool if it needed to. Yeah. And then we go out there once a month and swap them. That way we keep the running hours on them um, mm -hmm. about equal. Yeah, and that's what I tell folks, and we'll we'll talk about it in a, in a slide or two as well. But if you've got the the resources to put in dual AC units, um, size them just under what you need and put them in a lead lag, so that uh, one comes on at this temperature, one comes on at the next temperature, and then on the hot days, only one will be run, or they'll both be running a little bit, and on the cool days or the average days, only one will be running. And and like you said, absolutely, you got to swap them to keep the number of hours the same or close. And, and I'll tell you this too, it doesn't apply to you in Canada, but uh, where I live, we save $2,000 a unit by eliminating heat mm -hmm. from the from the unit. You know, we in South Louisiana, south of I-10, we just didn't need a heater in a transmitter site. So, um, you know, we just ordered it without that and that was a significant savings right there. Mm -hmm. um, that's just something to keep in mind if you live in an area that you don't need a heater. Yep. And that uh, comes up, I uh, see a comment here from Sean uh, mentioning that uh, he had a, an older MX-15 exciter fail to run at 101 degree room temperature. And and yeah, as, you, as some of the gear gets older, the uh, electrolytics start to get a little softer and they don't tend to work as well when they get warm. Uh, not just older, I mean, some of the older uh, first generation, second generation HD generators exporters and importers those things didn't play well when it got above about 80 or 90 degrees so definitely keeping the ambient down is not a bad idea i mean if you really want to have a low-tech alarm system it's like your your stuff is about to overheat for five or six dollars you can go down to the appliance store and buy yourself a thermocouple a thermostat like goes mm -hmm. in a dryer or a dishwasher, just one of those little click click thermostats yep, yep. that's for like a hundred degrees. Uh, mm -hmm. You can probably order them off Amazon and hook that up to your remote control as a relay closure. And when it hits that set point, it's going to click and yep. you're going to get a phone call saying, hey, you reached this temperature. You um, can grab one of them older Honeywell bimetal coil yeah. uh, thermostats, I mean, with the little mercury switch in them. Same yeah. same. You know, yeah, same deal. But I'm, I'm just thinking about the cheapest thing you can find. I mean, those, those are like four dollars at the appliance repair. But anything, yeah, that of, and you could even use something like that to actually turn a device off. If yeah. you had a backup at another site, you could actually turn the transmitter off with that little thing. So, right. um, so one of the other things that I did find on, on buildingscience.com was uh, th there are several figures, and this is just one specifically, but and this comes back more to something that you'd want to hire an air conditioning tech to, to understand, but knowing your building, because you got to know how much air or heat you're going to lose just through the walls, right? You do. And you also need to understand what your wall is composed of, whether it's block, wood metal so how the thermal bridging is going to happen and also you need to like you were saying before you need to understand your environment so where your vapor barrier needs to go whether it needs to be on the inside or the outside based on whether the outside is going to be cold or hot and the funny thing about it is like we were talking about earlier we sort of flip the script a lot of times because maybe even down here in region one if you put uh, a giant 30 kilowatt transmitter inside the building, the inside of the building might be hotter than the exterior mm -hmm. in certain environments. You know, if you put enough heat load inside the building, so it yep. may change where the vapor barrier really should be, which is why I said this building science website is great. Take it with a grain of salt once you run the actual HVAC calculations with a professional. Right. Um, you know, just, just, this is the science. You have the information. Use it with a grain of salt. 
Right. And that brings us to the next part. One of the questions I get asked a lot is what size air conditioner do I need? And so those first two slides, I can't tell you what size air conditioner you need. I mean, especially like down in zone one, I got no idea how what the uh, convection heat or your ambient heat load looks like. So you're always best to engage a local air conditioning specialist to deal with that part. Now, I can tell you very specifically how to calculate how much heat that a transmitter generates, whether it's ours, whether it's anybody else's. You know, so that part, that's easy. And that's the math you're looking at right here. I mean, you know, you, you figure your TPO and whether it's AM or FM, TPO output power is output power. Um, if you're allowing for AM, multiply by one and a quarter to allow for the modulation index. Uh, divide that by efficiency as a decimal point. So like if you've got, uh, well, pick uh, one of our GV transmitters with 72% overall efficiency, you'd use 0.72. If you've got an older tube rig, you're going to, it'll vary. I mean, a grounded grid box might be as low as 35 or 40%. I've seen some some tube rigs up into the 65% mark, you know, to, to close to a, a current solid state rig. So very much work with your manufacturer if you can, or work with the uh, documentation. And when I talk efficiency, especially when you're talking tube rigs, remember we're talking overall efficiency not plate efficiency, which is DC. We need the AC efficiency for this. So um, anyway, power consumed, subtract the TPO and what you got left is the waste heat. Well, that's easy to convert to BTU per hour. And if you're air conditioning, tons of AC. Um, anything on there that, uh, that kind of catches your eye and makes you say, and don't forget this, Matt? Well, I know it seems like it's not a big deal in light of the transmitter, but at larger sites where it's more than just, you know, a little small, transmitter site don't forget all the ancillary equipment you uh some of some larger especially shared sites where you've got lots of people in there you've got transformer banks you've got all kinds of switch gear you've got lots of rack equipment and all kinds of other things in the site that just start to add up um, mm -hmm. you can have as much equipment in a large site with seven or eight uh lessees as you do in a toc uh, by the time you add up all their rack gear, it just depends on if they're all in a combined room or if they have individual rooms with their own AC units. So it's just mm -hmm. something you got to keep in mind. Um, so now uh, let's see. Uh, like I say, the things are questions and comments are coming in faster, and I can hit them. Um, but Dave Reitner asks, what MER or oh MER what MERV rating? Sorry, uh, the MER modulation error ratio. I'm missing the V, but. Uh, yeah, what, what MERV rating for air filters, and that varies a lot too. Like, I mean, on our transmitters, the, the filters we use in our current boxes are all MERV 8. But uh, depending on your air conditioning or air exchange system, whether you're using forced air or AC, that, that's going to vary depending on the manufacturer, right, Matt? Yeah, and it also depends on how often you change them. It depends on, you know, how you can go and find filters that are at a higher MERV rating, but because you bought a thicker filter and it's got more surface area, you can maintain the same back pressure level. So mm -hmm. it's all about how much surface area is in that filter. So the thing that you got to realize about a pleated filter is that when it's, it's how much surface area there is when you unfold it. Yep. So if you have a one inch thick pleated filter and you stretch the pleats out, there's really not much more surface area than when it was folded up. But if you have mm -hmm. a five inch thick pleated filter, there's an incredible amount more area. Like when I unfold that, it's gonna stretch way out. So you can have a MERV 12 five inch thick filter compared to a MERV 12 one inch thick filter. The one inch thick mm -hmm. filter is gonna have a whole bunch more back pressure yep. than the five inch thick filter because it's got a lot less surface area for that air to come through in the right. same size square. So, and uh, that is a real good point to bring up because depending, I mean, when you're talking a fixed installation that you've inherited, you may not have the flexibility to change the filter size, but if you're building up a new system, then you've got a lot more. And, and that's definitely a consideration you'd want to pay attention to. And, and another option that you can do, if it really matters to you, you can also add a plenum onto something 
where you can put a larger filter. So say your device uses a 20 by 20, you can have somebody, a professional, fold up a piece of, using, using 10, you can have them fold up a, a plenum to attach to that device that could use a 30 by 30 or a 24 by 30 filter that's a higher MERV rating. And it gives you more surface area than the manufacturer had requested. And then you're able to filter a little bit tighter. Uh, yeah. But not you just need to be able to get the manufacturer's requested amount of CFM into the device. And that's what you have to do. And then you can filter it as tight as you want, as long as you don't restrict the amount of air that they need into the device. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh... They say there's stuff coming in so fast that I am not keeping up at all. Um, Joe Epley mentioned the uh, map that we put up doesn't seem to account for elevation, and that absolutely does make a difference when you're talking cooling requirements in, in two regards. Uh, number one, as you get up higher, it tends to be a little cooler, but number two, is the air is thinner, so you got to move a lot more of it if you're using forced air. And, and there is a defined formula for that, too. Uh, very to, much. To D rate, yeah. Yeah, and and that is something critical to mention because almost every piece of equipment out there, and, and you'll see it in our transmitters, I know you'll see it in a lot of the competitor boxes, um, they have very specific D ratings per thousand feet or thousand meters above sea level. So as you go up in altitude, the maximum temperature that uh, you can have for an ambient does go down significantly. So uh, And I've, you know, I've, I've seen some transmitters that won't necessarily make the maximum power at really high altitude yep. all, all the time, especially in HD mode. Yeah, so, I've uh, got one yeah. running at uh, just a little over 12,000 feet that uh, it uh, it's not going to be running at 110% of rated power anytime soon. Hey, it will just very, very temporarily. Um, uh, one mention, hey, I'm new to this, horror stories are scaring me. It's like, uh, uh, after you've been doing it 30 or 40 years, uh, the uh, horror stories are the biggest source of uh, entertainment more than anything, but uh, it, it's earning it's the... It's all we've uh, got left, yeah. <laughs> all we've got left. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the scars, the scars all have a story. Now, I noticed that Alex is back, and Alex, I am going to unmute you again and... Uh, see if you want to uh, tell the story of uh, testing your GV10 out at uh, plus and minus. And uh, you will you watch, uh, this will be the part where Alex is back on the phone again. So um, I'll just leave him unmuted and we'll see if he turns green anytime soon. Um, flipping back, let's see. I'm sorry about this, but I have, like I say, I've not seen comments come in this fast before. I'm gonna need, an, I'm gonna have to add a third screen. This will be my new, uh, my new um, budget uh, request. Uh, now, one mention that uh, Dennis Christensen makes is too low a hum humidity is also an issue because of the static, and that's not a uh, that that's not wrong. I mean, you know, in Louisiana, maybe. Well, I guess if you crank the AC up all the way, you could get too low. But well, uh, that's not actually the only thing. Uh, when you have an environment where humidity is too low, it can cause uh, like wood to crack or uh, warp in your walls, uh, mm -hmm. depending on what your building's made of, cause all kind of issues. But yeah, we used to have issues here in the studio with people dragging their feet across carpet and getting shocked, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where we'd have to, there's actually a, a, a fluid you can get, you can put it in a pump up sprayer and actually spray it on the carpet to try to get rid of some of that. It's an anti-static uh, yep. compound. Yeah, I've heard a lot of that. folks talking about, uh, what is it, Downey or Febreze or, or yeah. one of the uh, fabric softeners working for that, that uh, they also... I mean, even water will work, but this is something that maintains that effect for a little while. Right. So uh, definitely that is absolutely... Um, and, and when we talk about temperature and humidity control, we are talking in both directions. Because, uh, you know, you, just like you can have too hot, you can have, well, maybe not so much in Louisiana, but you can have too cold in some parts of the world. Uh, and uh, we have a minimum spec for temperature as well. Um, I had a couple of requests, and John Van Milligan has made a good comment uh, about uh, this as well. But a couple of requests about um, forced air versus uh, air conditioning. And that, again, comes back to being incredibly situational. 
Um, if I was in Louisiana, I probably would not be using forced air for cooling any facility. No, I, I think, well, I can tell you definitively uh, in the market that is next door to us about an hour down the road, the gentleman that we bought it from used to use forced air to cool all of the transmitter sites. So they all have a giant three foot hole cut in the wall where a fan used to be that we've now covered up. All of those transmitters, I have rebuilt them from near about from scratch because they were chock full of like a gooey debris, mm -hmm. basic, basically pollen. And right. uh, there is no filter that you can place over that fan that's good enough to keep out every bit. And I've heard the same thing from people in Texas about like sulfury deposits around mm -hmm. some of these oil field things. Um, in certain areas of the country where it's very moderate and temperate, it works out fine. But yeah. in areas of the country where it's very humid and there's a lot of pollutants, uh, natural pollutants in the air, I don't. I think it's a no-go. I've And I've seen these systems when I lived in Mississippi plug up with uh, grass cuttings from the field where the farmer's out there cutting grass and the fans suck the grass up into the filter and plugged it up. That's yep. one of the, it shut the transmitter off. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the thing's got to be able to breathe. And um, it costs money to run a fan, just like it costs to run an air conditioner. Running a three or four horsepower motor is not free either. Yep. So. Uh, one of the things that I've run into a lot, and uh, I was going to ask him to, to be with us today, but I, I knew just right from the get-go that uh, we're, we're going to push time because there's so much to talk about as it is. Uh, Clay Freinwald in uh, Seattle talks a lot about clean air rooms and uh, double stage filtering. And those help a lot in a situation like that. But again, if you got massive humidity and, uh, you know, well, like uh, Mississippi during cotton season, I mean, the air, you could practically shovel it. So, uh, you know, between the dust and the cotton bowls. So, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be situational depending on where you are. If you are using forced air, a clean air room is an awesome way to go because you can put a little eight by eight plywood room off of your transmitter building, um, put a wall of uh, bag filters, for example, as the first stage, and then a, a wall of uh, pleated paper filters going into the transmitter room and move as much air as you want, and you can slap it together for a couple thousand bucks. But very much, I wouldn't uh, do it in a place where well, I mean, your neck of the woods, a pleated paper filter exposed to the outside humidity is probably going to disintegrate in about two days. Yeah, it's it's pretty harsh. We normally have to go with uh, like a metal filter, yeah. um, you, you know, and those rust. Mm -hmm. So um, those have to be, you know, all that is a maintenance item. It just has to be changed. What I ge generally try to do is just seal the building completely as best as it possibly can be. And actually, in some installations now, what I'm doing, if you want to get some interchange of air, you can put in an ERV. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's actually, uh, um, it takes some air from the room and exhausts it out and pulls some air in and brings it in through a HEPA filter. And right. that allows you to be able to have some fresh air bring coming into the room and bringing some stale air out. But that's not really necessary in the transmitter side unless it's really small, like a shipping container. Right. Um, and get, to work. Yeah. So, so getting back to the northern climates, uh, Minnesota, Michigan, uh, even Minnesota. I mean, I've been in Minnesota. You know, my uh, my wife's from that neck of the woods, and uh, we we've spent entire months where the daytime highs were above 100 degrees every day. So, it, it still gets pretty toasty. And the the thing about bringing ambient air in is you're not cooling anything below that ambient temperature. Right. And, and I mean, that's something just to keep in mind. And I mean, there, there's a lot of folks talking and we got a, a, a question earlier about whether we were looking at liquid cooled. And well, I'm not going to tell you what we're looking at. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those. If, if we do it, you'll see it. But uh, but the um, liquid cooled transmitters, you still have the same considerations because you're not going to cool yourself below the ambient temperature unless you use some sort of augmenting like refrigeration unit of some sort. So uh, definitely, again, not a plus, not a minus. It's just one of those factors that you want to pay attention to when you're designing a facility. And if you are using forced air, and this is something I beat the drum on a lot and almost never see, a positive pressure will keep your gear living a whole lot longer than, uh, so, so the average site, 
and uh, Matt, I'm sure you've seen a ton of these. You walk into a, a ventilated site, there's a big honking exhaust fan dragging uh, 2,000 cubic feet a minute air out of the room. And there's maybe a couple of elbow vents with maybe a filter on it if you're really lucky, or quarter inch hardware cloth if you're not, dragging all the outside dirt and dusting and stuff into the room. But there's no intake fans to provide the pressure. So the air is really getting sucked in through every crack and crevice in the building, along with all the dust and dirt and crud and everything that doesn't have to go through the filters. Uh, yeah, I learned that a long time ago. You know, uh, you just, it's almost impossible to keep anything in a, out of a negative pressure environment. Um, yeah. I, just, uh, just try it and see. I hit one site in the Bahamas many, many years ago where there was a quarter inch of salt around all the edges of the door, just built up from the salt air being dragged in over the door frame over the years. Um, you know, every, every nook and cranny in the building, you could spot them all because of the big white heaps of salt that had just evaporated there over the over the life of the gear. It's, it's the only transmitter I've ever seen where aluminum had uh, corroded holes in it. So it, it was, you know, it was a, a fun little learning experience. That's where I learned where the metal caps that we used to put on the MOSFETs had, uh, were made of actual steel because they all rusted. But, uh, you know, when you pull an amplifier out and you can identify the uh, components by the rust spots, that's, uh, that's entertaining. Um, uh, talking about forced air, Dennis Christensen mentioned the transmitter that it rained in. Um, the transmitter was exhausted directly outside and the inside of the room was air conditioned. And because the transmitter was an aux, of course, it's not always running. So it's not pushing air out that vent. So the warm air from outside came in that exhaust vent, condensed and rained into the transmitter, which ended up having it hauled off for junk. That's one of those things that's really easy to forget. If you do have a ducted, a combination of uh, forced or air conditioning and ducted systems, you really have to be sure to look at where the air flows, both when the gear is on and when it's off. And uh, that's one advantage of just totally sealing it and air conditioning it is you don't have as much to uh, think about in that regard. So, uh, you know, again, pluses and minuses for sure. Absolutely. Uh, just scrolling down, um, John Van Milligan mentions they like two AC systems plus an emergency exhaust system, and uh, that uh, ties we, in. We with, prefer that, yeah. Yeah, and, and a couple of reasons, uh, especially if you're in a colder climate again, like, well, John's in Colorado, I know, and uh, I've got a bunch of folks here from Minnesota, Michigan. I see some Wisconsin, uh, uh, Washington, all over the world, uh, the Philippines, everywhere. But if you're in a colder climate, uh, the advantage is in wintertime, typically the AC units aren't going to be running nearly as often. Uh, the challenge with that is your transmitter facility can get uh, pretty cold. Well, if you, of course, can cycle the transmitter into the room, but you can, in a lot of times in the wintertime, you really don't need to run the AC. You can just cycle cooling air in as required from outdoors. So, uh, yeah, it, as you said earlier, it costs money to run a fan, but relatively speaking, if I got to run a, a four horse fan or a five ton air conditioner, I'm going to make the judgment call there. I, so, I will let you learn from a couple of mistakes that were made at a couple of sites that I uh, have been involved with maintaining. Um, don't ever let anybody install a generator next to the intake fan of your emergency air in, uh, system. Because I have one site that I was part of maintaining where they had put the generator right next to the fan that was the emergency fan. And, you know, it's never on. But then mm -hmm. all of a sudden when your air conditioner doesn't work and you happen to be on generator, now you're sucking carbon monoxide into the building. Yep. And so, you know, that was a bad situation. And the other thing, if you have one of those systems, and uh, I heard somebody mention this on another call the other day, make sure the louvers are spring loaded and not just gravity fall because right. uh, you want them to close. You don't want humidity and other things coming in through those louvers. And also put a piece of hardware cloth or screen or something over the inside on the, mm -hmm. both the intake and the exit because you don't want rats and stuff coming Critters in there. coming in. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, on that, one other note with the spring-loaded louvers, and I am currently in the process of replacing a transmitter where they had some really good sideways wind coming through with a nice Iowa snowstorm, and it filled the uh, tube cavity of their transmitter full of snow, which, of course, very promptly and cheerfully melted and uh, turned into what snow turns into when it melts, which is anti-electronic component. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that's what happened in that case. They didn't have anything spring fit and it uh, just, it blew back in. I think that was their standby at the time. Um, William asks, what are your thoughts about lead lag controllers versus separate thermostats? And, and that's a good question. What, what do you think about that, Matt? I'm, I'm torn right now. I'm in the mode of separate thermostats simply because again, it's, separate but redundant if you have a lead lag controller that fails however uh if you go with us if you go with a thermostat make sure that it's wired to run off of the unit with the battery in it being the backup because again i've been involved with some sites where the air conditioner would quit working and you'd find out that it was the battery in the thermostat that was bad because mm -hmm. whoever installed the air conditioner didn't run the power wire from the transformer in the unit to power the thermostat. So it was always on battery, yep. Correct, and it would last about a year and then it would quit. Yeah, yeah. and beyond that, I mean, I treat uh, thermostats, smoke detectors, temperature sensors, anything with a battery in it gets a new battery every year, whether it needs it or not. Um, let's see, Paul Meyer mentions that uh, transmitter he's familiar with, oh, an NV30. I think I may know that transmitter too, Paul. Air handler hung above and just behind the transmitter. Sometimes over the winter, the drain elbows can go dry, so they don't drain so well. And when the air filter gets clogged, the uh, coil freezes, the drip pan under begins to fill with water. So again, and forget where I saw it recently. I saw an article about uh, air conditioner maintenance. And they, they mentioned the uh, little, uh, well, cleaning the, the drain uh, line and the, uh, anti-algae uh, tablets that you can get. Uh, and th that is something that is a good point on air conditioner maintenance. I mean, all I could say about air conditioner maintenance is have somebody go do it twice a year, whether it's you, a professional. I prefer a professional, but I know there's some people on here that prefer to do their own maintenance. But it's not whether or not you can afford to do it. It's whether you can afford not to do it. Because if you're not doing it, I've worked with some people that, that didn't do stuff till it broke. It's very expensive to operate that way. Well, um, that's, it costs uh, you a to... lot more money in the long run to not maintain stuff. We've got a webinar coming up in a couple of weeks about uh, deferred maintenance, and uh, I'll, I'll be telling a few stories. Um, Matt Hurden is our uh, disembodied voice this week. And uh, Matt, if you're in the background uh, about halfway down, William Harrison put a link for our Amazon for a uh, thermostat switch circuit. If I could get you to uh, copy that link into the uh, chat so everybody can see it, that would be really cool. Um, Indeed, I will. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dan mentions that uh, on the, the one he was talking about earlier where they had the site, he ended up building a, a little Arduino controller to uh, literally notify him whenever he uh, had temperatures. And, uh, and, and yeah, whether you do it, um, let's see, with, with our newer boxes with the uh, site controllers built in, you could go with, like you were talking about, Matt, with a really simple thermostat, just provide a closure to the transmitter and use that to send you an email to say, hey, your temperature is above X degrees. Right, and I've seen people too, I've been to some sites where people put two or three of those simple $10 thermostats on the wall that were set at different set points. And it was like, if it achieves this, do this. If it achieves this, do this. And it was like a stair-step level of, you know, call me, shut me off, turn this fan on. Mm -hmm. um, but you got to rely on people not to touch them, um, right. you know, in order, you know, if they go changing stuff, it'll mess you up. So, and uh, this comes to works. something that Dan mentioned and uh, one we got in the advanced questions, uh, dealing with headaches related to a thermostat being on the uh, side of the building where the sun shines on a regular basis. So the uh, sun heating the wall is actually changing the, the temperature that the thermostat thinks it's seeing. Um, and it's uh, really messing with the, uh, so what would you do in a situation like that? I mean, move it. You're some, I was going to say, send or 
you mounted on styrofoam maybe something like that um well i mean the thermostat doesn't have to be in that certain oh. location you certainly right. you know run more thermostat wire and move it um you know another option also and we just did this here in our studio building we just replaced all of our thermostats with thermostats that uh you can put a sensor on and then you can actually add sensors to those thermostats and put them where the heat load is um mm -hmm. or w in this case where people happen to be but in a transmitter site um you could add those sensors either wired or wireless to certain thermostats to be able to put them where the heat load is right um now one of the other external questions and i'm going to get you to uh to address this as well um so non-tail transmitters have temperature sensors inside them. How hot is too hot and how long at a high temperature is too long? Um, so the short answer to that is we spec zero to 50 degrees Celsius. Um, 50 degrees Celsius is 104 plus 18, 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I wouldn't run a transmitter at 122 degrees Fahrenheit for any length of time because the electrolytics and just about every other component's not going to like it. Um, do, what, what kind of guidance do you use, Matt? So the federal government did a study years ago, and I'd have to drag this up on the internet, but I, I recall the gist of it. Basically, if you use good common sense, um, the temperatures that silicon junctions operate at is so far above what a human is comfortable to operate at that, you know, just because we're hot, a microchip is not hot. You know, it they operate 150, 180 degrees. That's not a problem for them. However, mm -hmm. they studied that at a certain junction temperature, this was the mean time between failure. And yeah. every five degree rise above that junction temperature, this was how many years that you shave off the mean time between failure. So mm -hmm. yes, can it operate at the manufacturer's rep? Can it get the manufacturer's recommended lifespan at their recommended operating temperature? Absolutely, because they proved this out in testing and they know what it will do. Can it operate higher? Most certainly it probably can because they know what the maximum junction temperature is of this device. How long will it do so in question? Yeah, up in the air. So, up in the uh, air, yeah. And I but mean, it's your money, you bought it. You can certainly <laughs> run it how you like. They'll sell you another one 10 years from now when it goes out. Well, I might not. I'll probably be retired. Oh, yeah, I don't know. 10 years, I might still be kicking around. As keep having this much fun. You never know how long I'll be. you'll, you'll be stuck with me. Um, yeah. But, yeah, that comes back to a question that we had earlier on, too, um, about uh, fans and fan lifespans. And uh, engineering kind of kind of argued with me on this recently. So they, they say that uh, things have changed a little and they're they're better than they were. But historically, it used to be fans were specced at 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And for every 10 degrees Celsius or 18 degrees Fahrenheit that you decrease the ambient below that, you doubled the nominal lifespan of the fan. Uh, whether it's still that ratio, I couldn't say, but, but what you're saying with that federal government study lines up with that, that uh, keeping them cooler does tend to, on average, assuming you don't blow it up with poor grounding and a lightning strike, does tend to uh, make stuff live longer. And and I can almost guarantee you, if you pull the data sheet on the transistors you use in your transmitter, there's probably a curve for lifespan versus temperature on the data sheet. It's mm -hmm. on, they're on a lot of data sheets, they have that kind of stuff. So, yep. and you'll see that it's like for every so many degrees, it reduces the mean time between failure by this much. So yep. it, it's well known, um, you know, and again, these are not temperatures where, um, you know, most humans can't function above 120 degrees. Uh, right. Transistors can easily function above 120 degrees for plenty amount of time. However, mm -hmm. the difference is, uh, I mean, just download one of those little apps and see what your video card and your computer is running at right now. Yep. It's probably running at 140, 150 degrees inside that case on your computer. However, mm -hmm. overclock that and see how high can you run it before it starts to glitch. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's and then how much how many years you're shaving off the life of that by running it close to the limit. You know, they're right. trying to build in some margin for error. And, and that's the challenge. Yeah. You know, we'll spec where we expect it to run. 
And we'll spec that with the theory that we expect it to at least outlive the warranty. Um, Bingo. Beyond that, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that you can run 50 degrees ambient and that's Celsius, again, 122 Fahrenheit. I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to recommend you run it at that level for the next 20 years and expect not to see some issues. Um, one comment about uh, altitude, uh, 4,000 meters over sea level. So that's about 14,000 feet at a rough guess. Um, talking about five kilowatt uh, NX transmitter, what power should you expect? So Luis, the question isn't so much the power you can expect, it's the ambient temperature that you can work with. And uh, we nominally, it's derated. It used to be, uh, I wanna say two degrees per thousand feet, uh, but I'm guessing because I don't have a manual in front of me. Um, so if you air conditioned the room really well and had it down at 20 degrees Celsius, you could probably get full power without an issue. Um, if you are running it at a, uh, at a full power at 40 degrees Celsius, you're, well, you're not going to get full power because that's when it'll start to overheat and shut itself down. And so the thin air does make a difference. Um, and that, that's the sort of thing. And, and one of the other things that we mentioned it briefly earlier was uh, talking about airflow direction. And I'm just going to click through the animations on this slide. But uh, so if you look down, this is what I was talking about. I see a lot of them where like the front of the transmitter be at the bottom of this picture. Um, the air is flowing behind the transmitter and they're just blowing it past at 100 miles an hour. And the challenge is, of course, that most of the air doesn't go through it. Uh, what do you do? I mean, I'm short of uh, turning the transmitter around. Uh, I've had sites where I've literally leaned a uh, an old interior door up against the side of the transmitter just to force the air through it. So we ran into some issues like this uh, at one of the sites that we re-engineered after a flood. Um, it's been very common nowadays with solitate transmitters. Old transmitters pulled the air in from the back, blew it out the top. A lot mm -hmm. of transmitters nowadays that are on the market are pulling air in from the front, blowing it out the back, or in some cases, pulling it in from the back and blowing it out the top. It just depends on whose transmitter it is. Uh, in this case, the new transmitters we purchased were pulling it in from the front, blowing it out the back. And guess where the air conditioning vents were? They were mm -hmm. in the back and blowing it into the hot air that was coming out the back of the transmitter. And mm -hmm. what we ended up doing was raising the transmitters up on a platform so yep. that the air could go under them and be pulled back in through the front. Um, we used a clear camera to figure out where the airflow was going. I'm going to show uh, a picture about that in a sec, too. Yeah. Um, um, so that's one thing. The other thing is you run into a lot of the mini splits. And, and uh, you know, there, there's one with a, a four-letter brand name that uh, everybody likes, and, and they're a great air conditioning unit. But they're primarily designed for office buildings where they shoot the cool air out up high and let it settle down. And then they pull the uh, the warm air return is at ground level. The problem is, of course, that, and I've run into, a, like you were saying, they'll, they'll be installed right behind the transmitter. So they're pulling the air in for the cool air return. The transmitter's trying to pull the air in to, uh, to cool itself. And you end up actually starving the transmitter and running negative air pressure in the transmitter itself. I've, I've seen some, I saw one where when you turned the air conditioning unit on, the fans in the transmitter actually started to spin backwards. Yeah, and that's why actually I, I didn't give you this picture, but I put a picture online the other day for somebody else. If you are using a mini split in a situation where it's not convenient exactly to put the unit where you need it, you can actually build a plenum and set the mini split inside it so that it pulls the return air from a better location yep. and uh, by building like a wooden box and sticking filters in it and moving the intake say behind the transmitter where it can pull some of that exhaust air back over there and yep. chill that and then blow it back in the front where it's getting the air and pulling it back in. Um, and that uh, comes back to something that Todd uh, Gaskell had asked, is there value inducting the AC air to the front air inside of the transmitter? And the short answer is yes. Put the cold air where the intakes are. And, and the other thing you got to be careful about, let's say you have a bunch of transmitters that all pull their air in from the front and blow them out the back. Well, you don't want to put them all in a row. 
because <laughs> that's not i mean that means the every single one of the ones except for the first one's going to get a lot hotter yeah so yeah, there's yeah. a lot of little gotchas you know in site planning that's why right. i was in my article i said it's really important to draw these things out either on paper with a pencil or on a computer mm -hmm. so you can see the mistakes you're about to make before they become dollars that's um, it and, yeah. and that's uh, one of the things like, uh, and I know we do it. Uh, we, we have a pre-installed book that goes out with every box that gets ordered uh, and it goes out at order time, not when the transmitter is delivered. But one of the things in it, there's, if you scroll in about 10, 20 pages through the PDF document, there's one 11 by 17 page that shows the uh, footprint of the transmitter, the goes into us and the goes out as for both air and electric. And I mean, that on its own, if you only keep one page of that book, that's the page you want to keep. Um, yeah, Joel Epley mentions have 50 and 100 kilowatt stations in 12 by 12 buildings without air conditioning. Not fun in July. And that on its own is an understatement. The smaller the site and the more extreme the temperature zone, the more important it is for you to get all the details right. Because yeah. if if you are in you know, South America and the site or or Alaska and the site is teeny, then you better get it right because you don't have any margin for error. Your building doesn't have a lot of airspace in there for you to cool or heat. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a capacitor. It's not functioning as a capacitor for you. Right. Um, yeah. And that's something that uh, talking about uh, airflow again. Um, sorry, Jerry uh, mentions that uh, air intakes need to be high and wide from field crops, and and yeah, not not just field crops. Uh, he also mentions drifted snow, but uh, if you are running forced air, you definitely need to locate your air intake. I I ran one site or ran into one site. Sorry, I didn't run it because it wouldn't have been done like that, but. Uh, the air intakes for a 50 kilowatt AM were four two foot square holes in the wall. And each one of them had a thousand CFM fan in it. So they're moving a massive amount of air in. And they did have exhaust fans, so they're ducting air out. Well, each of these intake holes, if you will, had an elbow duct on it to keep the critters in the rain from blowing in. And uh, a quarter inch hardware cloth. And in dandelion season, and uh, during uh you know when the uh the cattails are, are in bloom so to speak the back of the transmitter looked like a teddy bear exploded with all the white fluff in it so uh definitely you know locating. i, I see we're getting kind of to the end but there are a couple yeah. things we hadn't touched on and i do want to touch on them uh yeah. one, of, one of the things i see very often that people don't consider to be important and it is important in a transmitter site is um insulation ventilation like you said humidity control but insulation is very important yeah. if you're going to use uh, a positive pressure environment then you want your in insulation to be on the inside in my opinion most of the time if you're going to use a ventilated environment you may consider the opportunity to put your insulation on the outside of the building That's because you may you may want to look at radiant heat and trying mm. to keep the heat from ever getting into the building to add to your heat load that you're already trying to deal with. Yeah. And there I are saw, some good options about doing one, that. Uh, one shipping container install where they had pray, there's sprayed uh, two inches of, uh, it was basically an epoxy coated foam on the roof. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it, it made a hard white cover that uh, you know allowed very little heat in as far as convection heating from the sun. Right, so that, and you can do a, you can do all kind of stuff like that. You can put foam panels on it, and then clad it with siding. Uh, there's yeah. a lot. If you have a wooden building now, they make OSB that has foam adhered to it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different things you can do, uh, but um, by putting your insulation on the outside, that keeps the heat from ever entering your building. So yeah. that's definitely an option if you're going to be using ducted air that comes into your transmitter and then gets blown back out but it's not being used to cool your room because mm -hmm. uh, some people are doing that they're pulling the air straight into the transmitter like yep. with a plenum and then mm -hmm. blowing it back out the wall and so yep. maybe they have a small air conditioner for the room but it's not much then well, you definitely might want to look at yeah. same situation if you're running a liquid cool transmitter with an external heat exchanger then 
you know, you get smaller air conditioner for the room, but you still do need to cool the room to some extent, or you're heating up all the electronics again. So, right. So you might want to look at external insulation for the building just to keep the radiant heat load off the building. Right. And like that block in that picture, you absolutely. This is one of my pet peeves: is unsealed block. Unsealed mm -hmm. block is very porous and porous, porous and permeable. And um, we had a site here that was extremely humid and dank all the time till I painted both sides of the block with dry lock. Mm -hmm. And uh, just putting a couple of coats of dry lock on there, um, now the site is just very dry and pleasant to be in all Makes the time. Big yeah. difference, yeah. Big difference. And, and that comes down to um, air condition and size. And we mentioned it earlier. Um, work with a local air conditioning guy who can look at your building and figure out what the requirements are for your specific area. Um, definitely, we can tell you about the, or help you with the equipment in it, and then build your size accordingly. The other thing is, and, and I'm sure you've seen this one or twice, and I, I know we're running low on time, so we'll go pretty quick, but uh, you definitely need to put some security around air conditioning units these days. I've had $20,000 air conditioners damaged or destroyed to get $30 worth of copper condenser coil out of them. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I had a site when I worked for another company where they lost four air conditioning units in two months. Yeah. And we finally had to put steel cages around them. And I know that's a hassle for the HVAC technician, but you can't afford that kind of loss. No. It's, um, after it's the first tough. time your insurance yeah. company just kind of looks at you and says no. Yeah, you just have to do something. And in fact, those ventilation fans you were talking about, uh, a good war story, I had somebody... And I'm not 100% Try to climb in through one of those that was 16 feet off the ground. They brought mm -hmm. an extension ladder, tore the wire, and they almost got stuck in it. Uh, wow. And I found their ball cap inside the building where they fell off their head. So <laughs> that was kind of interesting. Uh, but yeah, that, you got to make sure. That's why it's good to put a screen over the inside because you don't want yeah. anybody, not just a mouse, but a person crawling through there. All um, the varmints. All so, the varmints, yeah. What we're looking at here is an example. Though behind that black rack, there's one of our V5 transmitters. Um, I haven't uh, looked to see if uh, Matt, another Matt, is in the audience, but if he is, he's probably rolling his eyes and groaning now. Um, this is the original air handling system, and another situation where the warm air was being pulled in down low and the cool air dumped out up high, because of course that's the standard for residential cooling. So. Uh, they were losing uh, power supplies because overheating. And we ended up, they rerouted the uh, intake, uh, the supply and exhaust air, so it followed the transmitter flow. And uh, they put in those two window units as backups, and neither one of those, to the best of my knowledge, has ever been needed. Because, uh, you know, once it was properly routed, it's amazing how much difference a good air handling system will do. Yeah, go out of your way to per, to persuade management that a window unit is not a good solution. Yeah, um, it's it's never a good solution. Uh, no, yeah, I mean mini splits. I'm I'm a big fan of mini splits. They're fairly cost effective these days, and you can build in some redundancy with them. But uh, but definitely one other question here. Uh, so. Uh, this is uh, a non-related, non-related to airflow specifically, but uh, just to, off the cuff, um, if you were in a humid environment and had a five-inch cable, uh, which would you prefer, dehydrator or nitrogen? Well, I'm in a humid environment, and what we do is run both as a redundant system. But if I only could run one, I would probably run nitrogen. Um, okay. because, um, well, it, it depends. Does it leak? <laughs> you know, if it, leaks, if it leaks, it gets awful expensive to keep it running. It's awful nitrogen. expensive, but I mean, uh, we, we typically run, I have a, uh, dehydrator system that has SNMP monitoring and where it'll tell you if it's, you know, if you have a leak and then we run a nitrogen system as a backup, yeah. uh, with check valves. Yeah. But and yeah, William Harrison hard. says nitrogen versus dehumidifier will start an argument really quickly. I mean, that's right up there with gas versus diesel on your generator. Um, yeah, it absolutely is. But, so um, Dave Reitner wants to know why no window units? 
Uh, my biggest problem with Wendy units is, first of all, I've never found a Wendy unit that really kept air from leaking through. Like, they're just not well sealed. You also, you have to cut an opening in your wall, obviously, to put it in there. And um, if you end up taking it out for whatever reason, now you have this big opening that has to be patched. Uh, I mean, I understand some people are on a budget. And if that's what you got, it's what you got. Uh, and if it's a really small site, like a uh, Lowe's, you know, parking lot building, then mm -hmm. maybe it's appropriate. But at the prices that you can get an Amazon level mini split for these days, um, it's going to work a lot longer. In fact, I just bought a mini split the other day and it came with a 12 year warranty. Nice. Find a window unit with a 12 year warranty and, right. um, and then let me know what it is uh, so I can buy one. That's the difference. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's just an economy decision for me. Um, right. And then also you can only find windy units so big. Yep. So um, then in the picture, they needed two of them. Yep. And, and those are pretty healthy units as those well. Those are 220 I mean, windy units, I'm sure. Yep. And there's uh, in this facility, there are two there are kilowatt FM transmitters. So. Uh, and, so the, and they're the backups to the the big yeah. uh, five ton unit that's running through that giant uh, silver foil. So here's the other thing: the mini split that we bought was a 28 sear mm -hmm. uh, mini split, and well, the nice thing about them is they start up real easy, so they don't draw a lot because they have. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember what the, the deal is, but basically they they start up extremely soft, so they don't hammer generators, they don't hammer electrical circuits. Um, right. You, you, you know, don't have the same kind of start surge that you do. Exactly. With, There's no start surge to them, really. Right. So, and I mean, air, cooling, this is one of our old 50 kilowatts, and we did a couple of field mods on that, adding extra fans to them because of things like that. Uh, the cast mica capacitors in an AM, for example, have a heat uh, rating, and when they're being run, they're usually fairly close to that just as a normal operating temperature. So you definitely want to uh, to pay attention to cooling in a situation like that too. Um, this is uh, down uh, actually not too far from you. This is in Beaumont, Texas, but mm -hmm. uh, that was a, a bunch of our uh, 40 kilowatt transmitters combined. And uh, this is the big thing. And, and Marty Scruggs makes the comment too. He has an air conditioning uh, company go to his sites monthly to change filters and just check general status and you know, keeps down repairs because they find problems. They just get proactive on the maintenance. And and that's definitely something you need to feel, like like you said earlier, maintenance isn't an option. Well, and the other thing too, when you're planning the site, don't put the transmitter backed up too close to the wall. Like leave, room leave enough air room for air to circulate back there and also for people to circulate back there. <laughs> like there's no good reason for you to create a situation for yourself to have to be operating in a cramped environment mm -hmm. um, i mean why i mean you know what for for what you're the one yeah. that's gonna have to work back there so right and uh that was uh another one uh and i, I see he's just uh had to leave but uh paul meyer made made the comment that uh cooling should air, should never be an afterthought project wise uh it, yeah. it should be part of the uh you know right up there with how much electricity and do we put in a generator uh, actually, a generator, I'd argue, could be an afterthought more so than uh, the cooling could be. And don't forget when you're sealing the building that the floors are one of the most important things to seal because especially if the people didn't think about it when they built the building to put a vapor barrier or insulate under the slab, you're going to have mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of humidity that could be coming up through that slab from the ground. So you're going to need to paint or seal that floor in some way to keep that from becoming part of your room environment. Well, um, and that comes back to this picture because not just that if you've got a concrete floor and it's not sealed concrete generates massive amounts of dust it does and i've seen that kill equipment yep and uh, i mean i, I back to this the thing. concrete block that's not painted yeah it and, and it's funny because like i'm going all around you this one you'll recognize that reprobate on the left hand side of this picture that's Corey meyer but uh this particular site's down in uh, gulfport biloxi so mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that, that wasn't intentional. That just happened to be the picture I had at hand. 
Um, folks, we ran 10 minutes overtime, which is, you know, pretty much normal for me. I don't think I've ever finished on time. Uh, at my funeral, I'm going to be the late Jeff Welton. But uh, it's a bad joke. I had to do it. Bump. Yeah. Um, this webinar and every other webinar we've done will be archived on our uh, website. You can get to it or on our YouTube channel. In addition, the uh, service folks have some uh, great little how-to videos on the YouTube channel, little things where we get a lot of questions and, uh, you know, that uh, they think they might be able to provide some tips. Uh, Waves newsletter, there's a new one coming out. Probably, uh, I don't think Fiona's online, so she's not going to yell at me if I say in the next month or so. But, uh, you know, we try, I try to put a little tips article there and try to keep my part of it non-sales oriented at least. On that note, Matt, I want to thank you very much for uh, spending your uh, time with us today. I think we it's probably could have gone another hour and uh, still not hit everything. <laughs> We'd but, have been talking uh, to ourselves. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. They, they, most of them hung on. I've got the audience counter right here. But, okay. folks, I, I do want to thank you all very, very much for uh, spending your time with us today. Uh, I think we've got a little bit of a break coming up for a while. I've decided that uh, vacation would be a good thing to have at some point or another. but. Uh, Keep an eye out. We'll be uh, letting you know when the next webinars are. And again, thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Bye now.